Welcome to the Money and Meaning Show. I'm your host, Kenae Corder, National Certified Counselor and the world's number one clinical financial hypnotherapist. Each week, I'll share with you the research I'm uncovering as I chronicle the search for meaning over money. My interviews, tips, and resources will help you determine what you need to get the most out of your practice and your life. Because life is about more than money. It's about meaning. So let's get into today's show. Welcome to another episode of the Money and Meaning Podcast. This edition is good because we're going to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart. That is multiple streams of income. But we're also going to talk about legacy, which you know that the five prosperity pillars are wealth, health, adventure, love, and legacy. And legacy is one we talk about the least, I would say. But it's it's still a really important part of your idea of prosperity. And I have a guest here today who's going to be able to talk about this conversation with me because she's written books on it. So let me introduce you to our guest today. Felicia Fro, MD, is the owner of Money With Mission, an investment company focused on empowering professional women to build wealth and achieve financial freedom through social impact investing. In addition to real estate investing, Dr. Felicia Fro is a licensed urological surgeon with over 20 years of experience. She has written many best-selling books, including How to Create Wealth That Outlives You. Plus, she is an advocate for sharing the great work that others are doing in their communities through her podcast, Money with Mission Podcast. Today, we're going to talk to Dr. Felicia about multiple streams of income and how to create wealth that outlives you. So guys, please join me in welcoming our guest today, Dr. Felicia Fro. Hey, Felicia. Hey, Kane. How are you today? Oh, I'm so good today. Like I have, I have quite a few podcasts, interviews set up, and I have my Prosperity Club live hypnotherapy today. So I'm fired up. How are you today? I'm doing well too. I'm excited about that hypnotherapy. I'm I'm so ready to be free of some of the little blocks that I've got going on that you and I've talked about. Yeah, yeah, we all have them. And without a little help, sometimes they just stick there and you don't you don't ever get rid of them. You just live with them. And I think we believe that we have to live with them and we don't. Well, I think most people don't know they have them. So I think that's a big thing. So knowing that they are there is actually like we've, we've talked about the first step and then knowing that there's a way to get rid of them and taking that step to do that. That's all big, powerful stuff. Yes, it is. And I'm so glad that we get to talk about a subject that's kind of even after that, like knowing that you have the blocks can sometimes get in the way of those multiple streams of income because you think that you just get a job and that's it. Like the American way is just to go to school, get a good job. And so we're going to talk about other streams of income that are possible for us, but especially we want to talk about leaving that legacy and how to create wealth that outlives you. I just love the title of that book because we don't think about that, especially in our community, in the African-American community. Sometimes we're so focused on right now that we don't get to focus on our future and our, our future's future. Exactly. So before we get into that, let me ask you, what's your idea of prosperity? That's something I, I'm just going to admit. I never really thought about until I started talking with you, Kane. And I'm, it's, for me, it's a lot of things. But the first thing that comes to my mind is having enough money to do all of the things that I want to do. Yeah, I love that because... I'd say I've talked about it on this podcast before, but there I did used to do these workshops and there was a little boy. I used to ask this question of the kids and there was a little boy who said that that's what he wanted. Like, I just want to have enough money to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And then he said this other little thing that I thought was so profound. And then he said, and if I have enough money to do what I want to do, sometimes I could just not do it. Exactly. <laughs> I thought that was like so. 
out of the mouths of babes, right? Exactly. And that's what I hear when I hear you. It feels like there's this peace around having that money. It's there. You know, I can do what I want to do, big or small, or I could not. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. It, it's become a thing, you know, I, I mean, and, and I, by doing what I want to do, uh, make sure everybody hears want to do, not need to do. Cause a lot of times we're just working to get the money for what we need. Mm-hmm. I want money to do what I want. And if I want to give half of it away or give all of it away, I want to be able to do that. It's just yeah. a lot of different things. Absolutely. Yeah. And the way that I see that. So sometimes I have people come up with the three words that describes their idea of prosperity. And one of those words for me is freedom. And that is what I hear when you talk about your idea of prosperity. A hundred percent. And one of the things I really talk to my audience about is having options. And I mm. money gives you options. Many people think about money as in and of itself. I want this amount of money in my bank. That does nothing for you, actually. It might look good for a while. And then you're sitting at home with money in the bank. Being able, it's what money can do for you is the reason to me to want money not for the dollars themselves. One of the big things, and I've done a lot of, I've done real estate investing for over 20 years now. That's kind of scary. And like, like you said, I've been a urologist for almost 25 years now. With the investing, it took me a while to get to the place where social impact was my, was where I wanted to be. The multiple streams of income came to me after I read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad when it became clear to me that just that income from being a doctor, which was a great income, I made, I I actually did make enough money to do the things I wanted to do. I just didn't have time to do them (laughs) because I was always working to make the money. I had the same upbringing that many of us at our age have. It's like your parents tell you go to school, especially in our, in the black communities, because education was not, we weren't able to get education. So when we can go to school, get a great job, make a lot of money, stay in there until you get your retirement. That paradigm is gone. Mm-hmm. So, and we, when you live that paradigm, if you're in a job that you don't like, and that's your only source of income, you're stuck. And you have to deal with that guy who's a creep and puts his hand on your leg, makes you turn around when you walk in the room as a woman, that your mom gets sick and you can't go help take care of her because you have to stay there at your job. All those different things that can happen throughout our lives, when we only have one stream of income, we're stuck. That's where I got to. Multiple streams gives you options. Yes, yes. I love the way you put that. You describe that so ver- so well, so vividly, so that people can understand when that those options come into play, when you really wish you had the options, because not every day, you know, some days you're going to work and it's fine and you, you know, you're living your life and it's okay. But then one day you wake up and you're like, I don't want to do this today. And maybe you're not saying I don't want to ever do it again, but you're just saying, I don't want to do this today, but I know I have to because what, who's going to feed the babies if I don't go up? Yes, Yes. (laughs) exactly. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, people can love their job. There are days when you don't and knowing Mm -hmm. that you don't have to do it sometimes makes it that much easier to do it. You know, like, oh, I could quit this anytime I want. I could give the big flip the bird finger if you let that go in your podcast and give <laughs> <laughs> I have I have in the past had a word for the kind of money that we're talking about having your your second stream yes. and third stream of income. It's your F you money and you can do what you want to do. Just move exactly. on. Exactly. Like Yeah. Yeah, because in the end, if the opposite of F you money is like I'm F'd money right there you go exactly (laughs) exactly (laughs) it's it's a beautiful thing and you know while you're working and so many of us just put our head down and just work and you just work and you just keep doing it and you never can see how you how how could I ever get another stream of income I don't get it how how does this happen Mm -hmm. and it really happens by picking up your head and first of all realizing that you want it that's big. He's like, oh, I've got to do something else. I got to have money coming in another way. And then just looking around and seeing what there is. And there are so many ways today to make extra income. 
some things you can actively do. You can sell things. You can get, sell your things as in, you know, books and hard things or your services. We are all good at something and can offer that service to somebody to investing in real estate or investing, getting good at investing in the stock market. I don't like the stock market as much because I think it's very manipulated, but real estate is really easy to understand. Everybody's got to have some place to live. Everybody pays for it. Everybody makes it a priority to pay for it. And there you go. So many people think of owning real estate as slum lords and that kind of thing. But when enough people with integrity own real estate to rent to people who don't want to own or can't own, we we just raise everybody up because people want a nice place to live. People need a nice place to live. Yes, that is so true. And we're going to talk a little bit about that investment in a place to live, but also that that future place to live, because we're going to talk about legacy. And, and one of the things I know that you do is the assisted living. So I want to talk about that a little bit more in, in just a few minutes. But before we do, I want to talk about these multiple streams of income and how people don't see all the different streams. So I'm going to give an example from my life, and maybe you can give an example from your life or from the lives of other colleagues that you've worked with. So Without even trying, I had like seven streams of income before I knew it with Presidential Lifestyle. So, of course, I had my one-on-one. I'm talking to people, you know, healing trauma using hypnotherapy. That was my one-on-one. That was how I started. And then as time went on, what I started doing was recording these videos and these audios. And so I then be made that available to people at a lower cost. Sometimes it would happen after people would leave me, they would want to have these tools with them whenever they would need it. And so that was another income stream. They would buy those. Now that I made it once and then I sold it a bunch of other times. Mm -hmm. And then the audios that I had, I put them on a thing called Insight Timer. So Insight Timer is a meditation app and I recorded these meditations and that allowed me to sell those meditations. Now on Insight Timer, I don't have to do any marketing. They do all the marketing for me. I just upload the meditation, Insight Timer subscribers listen to it. Insight Timer sends me a check and I do nothing else but upload it. Remember, I had already recorded it and all I did was then upload it. So that gave me a third income stream. And just like that, I had three. And then that j- I started on another site similar to Insight Timer. I created a group. And so I didn't even get to real estate yet before I <laughs> ended up having several income streams before I even started even using the money. I was still just using the assets, the the intellectual property that I had. So that's just an easy example because I do want people to see that multiple streams of income doesn't one, it doesn't mean all of them are active because let's be clear, multiple streams of income does not mean three jobs, right, Felicia? A hundred percent. No, <laughs> no, that is, and I can feel, I can feel people tightening up thinking I can't do, I have got so many things to do right now. That is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about putting more on your plate at all. Yeah. I've been there. I've had, yeah. I've been, I've done the quote unquote Jamaican and I've had three or four jobs and I'm like, what the heck did I just do with my life? <laughs> Yes. Yes. It does. It does require some work up front. Like Kanae said, she had to do the recording and then she realized I can use this over and over and over again. That's, that's passive income. That's where that's the work you did the work once the work keeps paying you forever. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And then I don't do this right now, but I know other coaches and in, in even doctors that are like certifying other people to do the work that they do. So they've become the expert at something. And so they teach it to other people. And then those people kind of license out the information they have. So instead of them listening to the recordings over and over and over again, now they're teaching and probably making their own recordings, but they're licensing my intellectual property. Now I haven't done that quite yet. Uh And I'll explain later why, but that's another income stream is like that licensing and having intellectual property. So now we get into the assets. What, what were you, what would you say? Like, what are some examples of using your assets as an income stream? 
I mean, everything that makes you money is an asset. Ah, my, good. In, yep, you're right. Every, anything mm-hmm. that puts money in your pocket is an asset. Kane just listed all of her assets, the ones that she that are making money for her or have the potential to make money for her. For me, again, Kane is teaching me a lot just in what she just said about all the different ways I could make money and things other than real estate. I focus mostly on real estate and the way the way it's diversified for me is across markets. So my multiple streams of income, I have four single family houses in Kansas City. I call that one stream of income, but it's actually four. A real uh, investment in a resort out of the country, another stream of income. An assisted living home in Kansas, another stream of income. So I diversify mine through, it's all through real estate and hard assets like that. Kane's assets are intellectual property. We all have intellectual property. I think one of the problems is we don't always think that what we have is something special. And I'm actually learning that every day that what I have to present to the world is different from anybody else because I'm different. And we never know who who our audience is or who we are speaking to or who's going to get something from what we say. I think too many of us think that we don't have anything to say or nobody's going to listen. So that's, that's an important thing for everybody to realize is that your streams of income are coming from you and it's, it's, you really have it inside you. Sorry, that's off my, that's off the subject of the real estate, but did I answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my next question is, so you have this real estate, you, you named the real estate you have. Now, some people look at real estate as traditional, the home they live in. And then they say, okay, and now I go out and I buy an apartment building and I rent it out monthly. But what I just heard you say, you just talked about some different ways of having real estate as your income stream. Talk a little bit more about that. Correct. So I'm going to back up a little bit. We talked about asset and asset, something that puts money in your pocket. Anything that you have that give that pays you is your asset. Your own home, if you think about it, really is not paying you. You are paying for that. So that one is not strictly an asset. Yes, when you sell it, you'll make money and then it's an asset. But as every day, it's not. Okay. Backing up. A lot of us, you know, many, I probably, a lot of people just heard me talk about real estate investing and it's like, oh my gosh, it means I have to go and hear these people and, you know, clean their toilet or plunge their toilet (laughs) or do whatever you're calling me because your light bulbs broke. No, you don't have to do that. You can replace the hot water heater. (laughs) Yeah. You know, give me a break. I, I live in California. My family, my houses are in Missouri. There's a lot of reasons for that. And we could talk about that too, but I don't change. I don't do any of that. I don't even get the calls for that. I pay somebody to do that. So you put all of that into your pro forma or what your what the money's going to be. You put all of those expenses in there. It can get even better than that in that you can meet somebody like me. One thing I do is real estate syndication. So Kane talked about buying an apartment building. Many of us will walk around looking at an apartment building like, there's no way I can afford that. And many of us cannot by ourselves. But if 10 of us got together, we could buy that apartment building. If 10 of us got together and put together all the work and one of us wants to do the work, one of us wants to manage it, all of us are going to benefit from that. But one of us is doing most of the work or none of us are going to do the work. We are, we are all going to put our money in and hire somebody to do that. So there's ways like that where you are, you have the real estate and you have the tax benefits and you have all the benefits of real estate with it, when you did the work once and that's figuring out who's going to manage the money, who's going to manage the property. And now you're just collecting your checks until that thing gets sold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of recap from a, you know, I'm learning this from you. Okay. So make sure I understand. So it sounds like the group gets together, they buy a property together, meaning they pool their money together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody invests a certain amount. And there's some sort of document that suggests how this is being governed. We all put in this amount of money. We're all responsible for this. This is what happens. And and there is a document that states what this property is. I'm guessing in some sort of like LSE or corporation document that says this is how this is handled. And then everybody does their job. They stay in their lane or we hire the people who are going to, to manage the building. It appreciates and at some point we decide we're either going to sell it. But in the meantime, 
it is making money and we are accumulating wealth by the money that the property is making along the way. And then if we decide we're going to sell it at some point, we make money again when we do that sale. Is that what I hear? That is 100% what you hear. And sometimes you can be even more hands off than what you just said. It can be a group of us that go together and all work the whole thing. Or you can have one person as a syndicator. I find a deal. I vet the deal. I come to you and say, hey, I've got this great deal. Explain it all to you. There is definitely legal documentation that says everything. Sometimes you have a say in what goes on. Sometimes you don't. You put your money in. If it looks good to you, if you trust me, if it it really is comes down to trusting the person who is going to be handling your money and who is vetting deals. So, and then now you just get checks, you get checks Mm -hmm. and in the paperwork that you got, there's a, there's an end game or an exit strategy. At this point, we plan to sell. If that point comes and it's not good to sell and everybody's going to lose, then of course you wouldn't sell, but you know, there's all these things are spelled out at the very beginning as to how that's going to look. That's a great point that you make though. So it's it's pretty straightforward. It's scary because it, people think about it differently than their 401k. If you think about your 401k, your money gets taken out of your check and goes to somewhere that you don't know and it's there and one day you get it back. With this, you actually are looking at a person, talking to a person, say me, hearing everything that I'm doing. You get to know me. You know exactly who I am, where I live, what my phone number is. So if something happens to your money, you know exactly where to find me Mm -hmm. and you know what I've done with your money. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is it's scary in the sense of it's the unknown. And but because a 401k is more well known, we're more familiar with the 401k, but we don't know the asset manager who's or, you know, the manager who's deciding which funds go into the account and how long, how long you stay. And and you do some of your own trading in your 401k account. But let's face it, most people don't even know what they're doing and what mutual funds they're choosing. So even though they're scared of this unknown thing and they're familiar with a 401k, they're really, that's more scary because you can't even, if anything happens to your money, you can't even explain what happened to your money, nor can you go knock on somebody's door and be like, can I get my money back? What happened? What happened? Right. Exactly. Explain to me what, what just happened. I think, I think 401, I look at 401k money like this is you put your money in a suitcase and you hand it to the person that came to your door and said, Hey, give me your suitcase of money today. Mm-hmm. You have no idea who that is. Right. You have right. no idea what they're going to do with your money. You know, you have no idea really how much they're making on your money because it is very, very manipulated. It's super scary to me. And I'm saying all that. And yes, I do have a 401k because my job has one and has a match. I think of it yeah, more yeah. of a savings account. And as soon as I can get it out of there, I'm going to get it out of there and do what I can understand. Yeah. And, and because I work in the industry, as long as I have, I see benefit in all of it. The mm-hmm. 401k has a benefit and especially if it has a match. Now, if it doesn't have a match, then the benefit might be that you just to get to participate in something because for some people, the multiple strings of income, they're far, farther away from that than, well, you're closer than you think you are, but they're f- far enough away that the 401k is there. That's one way to get you some future money. It's not money you're going to have right now, but at least you could be setting yourself up for the future. So the benefits in it, but the problem is what you said. We don't understand it, nor do we try because it seems like everybody else understands it and we don't want to be the one dummy in the room that does not So we just pretend like we understand it too, which we don't. And you could just ask questions or what. Thankfully, now there are podcasts and blogs and things that you can read and and listen to to get more educated but because we're not educated enough on them we fear them so I'm just going to recap a little bit so we have our active income we have a job and that job is allowing us to have the 401k which is not immediate income but it's for income in the future and hopefully we're at least put it contributing up to whatever the match is. And then outside of that, we have some either passive or semi-passive. And I don't know if to call this an investment. I guess it's a semi-passive investment where we choose a real estate project to put our money in. That project makes money along the way. And then it later has a bigger payoff in the future that we get the investment we put in and some 
amount of money over that back. And then also, if we're using the intellectual property, the knowledge that we have, we're also packaging that up into some sort of income stream. And maybe we're selling it by our recording it and and sharing it as a course, or we are teaching it to others and allowing them to sell it and licensing our unique system to other people. So those are a few, the few that we've talked about so far. Did I leave anything out? You didn't. I just wanted to point out with real estate in our lives, actually, our biggest expense in our lives is taxes. Mm. And so figuring out how to pay less taxes should be high on everybody's on everybody's list of things to do. Not because you don't want to pay or help do your fair share for the country, because that's where your taxes go to work for the country or your city or your state. It's to have more control. I mean, I want to give money away. I I, I just want to give money away, but I wanted to give it to places where I know it's going to go for what it's supposed to go for. And we really don't have that much control over what our money does as far as our taxes and where that money goes. We have very little control over that. So while I'm not against paying taxes, we have to pay taxes. We have to support each other through paying taxes. I think we can support each other as well, if not better, through our private contributions. So. Yeah, absolutely. And no one wants to pay more than their fair share of taxes, pay your fair share. And then you also have those other areas. So we talk about the money cycle being earned, grow, protect, gift and enjoy your money. And that protection part, that's where we talk about that risk management and that tax management. You want to manage your taxes mm-hmm. and then what you manage, you can put over into that gifting area that you talked about. You want to give to certain things. You don't necessarily want it to be Uncle Sam that you give your money to. You want to gift your money to nieces and nephews and children and charities and whatever you believe in, whatever your cause and your mission is. So I, I love that you made that distinction that real estate is one of those places where you get some tax benefit. Did you want to say more about that? Only I was going to say about one thing you've taught me is about knowing what you want to donate to and making that your thing, because uh-huh. I've always been a kind of spread out around the board. And it's, there's, there's things that I really, really resonate with that. I'm just like, I, thank you so much for giving me the power and the knowledge. Like I can just donate to this one thing and give all my money here. I never thought about that before. So yeah. That's- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite, favorite things. And, and, and it took me a while too to learn it. As you know, I, I teach it in the Embracing Wealth Masterclass because it's something that I spread myself too thin. And I was like, whoa, I'm saying yes to everything. But what if I had a way to say no? And now I have my way to say no, because I know what it is that I pour my heart into, what warms me, what keeps me up at night, you know? And so when we have that cause, or like I like to say, when we know our cause, then we don't have to spread ourselves too thin and and give more than our fair share because that will burn you out, right? Hey there, I know you want to become a Prosperity Pro. And one of the ways to do that is to take our money mentality quiz. Now at Presidential Lifestyle, we call your money personality, your money mentality. And we've learned that your money mentality is your money reality, whether you deserve it or not. Now, in my years of clinical practice, I found there are seven money mentality types. Do you know your money mentality? Well, you should, because not knowing it could be holding you back from getting to your next level financially. Maybe you're a spender or saver, or you could be an enthusiast or a hero. Now, I know you may not have heard of the last two, but if you take the quiz, you'll find out your money mentality. It's easy, fun and only takes three minutes because you already know all the answers. Take the money mentality quiz. It'll help you name your money personality so you can tame your thoughts, feelings, and actions around money. So go ahead, take the quiz. The link is in the show notes and you might even want to share it with a friend. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then you have nothing left to enjoy your money. Yep. 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 And I liked your, did you, was it an acronym that you said? 
know your cause is because you know those five know your pause know your cause know your mission know your vision like though all of the all of the things you have to know in order to create your money mission so that one doesn't have an acronym i you do love my acronyms but that one doesn't have an acronym it's more like a a framework my my acronym for learning for investing is live learn invest and the eyes also impact value, value your time, value versus cost. And then what one of yours, enjoy. You got to enjoy life. Yes, love that. And another one that we talk about a lot of times too is kind of know your numbers. Mm-hmm. And that's important too, because I feel like when people, and especially when we get to these multiple streams of income. So knowing your number you got the number and let's just throw a number out there. Let's just say it's $500,000. So $500,000 a year is what you feel like will give you the freedom to do the things you want to do and have the time that you want to have. And you can get to, let's say 250,000 from the job you have. Now the multiple streams of income that you have need to make up that other 250,000. I like to make that distinction because a lot of times people think, that if their number is 500,000, then it needs to come from that one income stream, that one job that they have. But sometimes you can take a job that might be 250,000 and get, you know, maybe you have the the $50,000 a year from your real estate and, you know, your intellectual property and whatever else income streams that you, you come up with. A hundred percent. Yes. It doesn't all have to come from one thing and, and in all likelihood it won't. But of course we all know those people who, especially these days with the apps and all the, the internet, the not internet, but on my brain. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about? Being able to venture capitalists and all these things that people are coming up with Uber, all the, all these things where people are making a lot of money pretty fast. It's there. It's possible. Intellectual property is the new real estate. Just say it, put it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a very, what I like about intellectual property and always has is that it's an asset that you can, like we talked about before, create once and then sell a bunch of times. And when I realized this, I actually bought a course myself and in listening to the course, and this was years ago, but in listening to the course, I'd realized that I paid, I think it was back then, it was like $250. And nowadays, the courses are like thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. But I paid like $250 for this course. And I had realized that the person had recorded this course five years earlier than I had purchased it. And she was still, still making, money, making on money on it. I know. I know. Yeah. It was it, beautiful to me. And I was like, whoa, I could do this. <laughs> And it gets it gets really icky sometimes because I buy I buy I bought things and I get the and I get paper courses sometimes in the mail and you look at it and you're like this thing was printed a hundred years ago and this person's <laughs> still making money on this I mean yeah the information is still relevant but you know this is old yeah so yeah it can now, last forever I want to talk about one more thing before we because uh, I still want to talk a, a little bit more about the assisted living and then the legacy okay. so but one more thing before is. Let's talk about books because I think people see books as an income stream and to the normal everyday person writing a book. If you're not a celebrity, books as an income stream, you might be slightly off. That's my take on it. What's your take on it? I agree 100%. My book, uh, my books have been a, are more of calling cards mm-hmm. and reputation builders than income streams. So they help with all the other income streams for me, make me that person that you're going to trust. So that's, that's the reason I write a book, not necessarily to make money off of that book. And I know there are people that do make money off of their books and ultimately maybe one day that'll be me, but that's not the purpose right now. It's to get the information out and get you to know me and how I think. And for us to get to be friends, I want to be friends with a whole bunch of people. I just can't get around them all at one time. Yeah, absolutely. And I I wanted to talk about that because I think that there is this misconception out in the world. And some of those people will make you believe that they're making so much money off of their books. And they really 
aren't unless they are selling millions of books. And those people who are like, oh, this book was translated into 12 different languages. And that, yes, that person is making money off of their books. But most people that you see who have a book, it's really not about the money they're making, but sometimes it's the impact. It's like, this is now one to many. If it was me with my idea, I can't reach all of these people, but I can create this book and it can create a connection. And like you said, that trust for that person to go on to the next thing with me, because maybe the book is how you first get introduced to me. And that is a low cost introduction to me. And then you say, okay, now I want to go a little bit further with her. Now I understand, I see she knows what she's talking about. The book helps you make a name for yourself and the making a name for yourself. Then you can then have those multiple streams of income and also have that, the bigger mission. Yes. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. I didn't, I didn't understand that either at, at first, but it does take a lot to make a lot of money from a book. Yeah. Exactly. Directly. Directly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People make money from their books. It's just not a, it's not, you don't, it's not pay for the book, make the money. It's, there's a whole lot of series that goes in there to get there for the majority of us. Yep. So exactly. Use it as a calling card. Yep. Put it out and- there. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the if the real estate that you invest in specifically and where you have become an expert is in the assisted living area. You can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, as I as I alluded to earlier, I started real estate investing quite a while ago. Started with single family houses, did some apartments and multifamily, and those things just were not fulfilling me. It was, there was cash. It was all that, but it just didn't feel like this isn't the end of it for me. Went to a course that learned and learned about assisted living, learned about residential assisted living. Now, when I think about a nursing home or assisted living, I think of not a happy place. It's dreary. It's see, I, I mean, I actually picture old people sitting in chairs and nobody paying attention to them. You get a, I get a smell that's not a pleasant smell, but with at residential assisted living, we took a house in a neighborhood on a cul-de-sac, added some square footage to that house. So it has a living room, a dining room. It looks like every other house, just more bedrooms. And that is our residential assisted living. So 12 beds, much smaller footprint. We don't have a hundred people coming in and out of there on a regular basis. 12 bed memory care and assisted living. You get, so our, our residents come in, they have all of their care for them, but it's in a home-like setting. So they come out to the living room to watch TV. There's a games area. There's a dining room. They, it's like, I don't want to eat these eggs right now. Can you bring me some toast? Whatever. No, it's, just, it's, it's a home, bottom line. It is a home. One of the things about this smaller footprint home within our current situation, our current environment with COVID, these smaller homes had much less COVID than the large ones. We we heard about all the nursing home deaths from COVID. That wasn't happening in these smaller footprint homes. And those are that this niche in the industry is really growing because of the more personalized care. In those large facilities, there can be a one to 30 ratio. So one caregiver to 30 people. In these smaller homes, it's one to six sometimes one to four. So much more personalized care. Everybody knows everybody, families, residents, caregivers, operate, everybody knows everybody. So it's just a much more intimate setting. Yeah. And it, and it sounds like it's intimate, but it also sounds like it's just more friendly. I don't know. That's the word that comes up. It, it, cause it, I, like you said, I, when somebody says assisted living, I have a grandpa, father who was in the assisted living kind of place. And then I worked in a psychiatric hospital in the legacy, what was called the legacy ward, which was the older people. And it is a certain smell and it is, it's just a neglect that that just breaks your heart. And this sounds so warm, like you, that you would like to leave your loved one at this place. Yes. And, and you would like to come and visit them there. Ooh, that's a good point not feel guilty about the fact that you had to do this. It is a hard decision to decide that I can't take care of my mother anymore. I can't take care of my grandmother anymore. That's tough. That's it really is big. And yep. when you can find some place like Golden Oaks, which is in Shawnee, Kansas, 
go there, you take a look, you go around, you're like, oh, this is okay. They have their own room. There's people that are going to make sure that, you know, he eats. There's people that are going to make sure that he gets a bath and a shave and all these things. And, and he can, you know, do what he wants to do as far as playing a game, watching TV, he gets his newspaper, magazines. I can come and visit. It's, it's, it's really, really, to me, the way of the future. And with dementia care and Alzheimer's with that, dementia is just the diagnosis is really going up hopefully we find a cure sometime in the near future these kind of places like we the studies have shown are a much better fit for that person to help de to help slow down the decrease in memory wow and i want to point out that you being a doctor didn't have anything to do with you being able to invest in something like this right there was there's no requirement that you be a doctor. Am I correct in that? That is, you're hundred percent correct. It's, it's not really medical care. Yeah. This is, mm-hmm. we call it activities of daily living care. So someone, you know, you come home one day and you found out your mom left the stove on and you're like, okay, mom can't live by herself anymore. She can still do a lot of things, but she can't live by herself. It, it could be a place like ours, like Golden Oaks, where they would come to live. Yeah. I wanted to point that out because it's, this is very possible for people to do, but it seems a little scary. Like you talked about in the beginning, even that, you know, the investment, the real estate syndicate sounds scary, but even this sounds scary too, because you're like, I just don't know enough, but you don't have to know everything. Cause there's you, like you said, you took a class to learn some of this, but then also there are other people doing this. It's not, it's, you're not the only one. That's the, that's the biggest thing I think we all get, we, when you start to do something new, you're scared because it's new. And then what you, sh- you put it out there, what you're looking for, put it out there. And so many people are doing it and are willing to help. That's the, the best part about, to me, entrepreneurship and business is how many people there are to help you be successful. Are there yeah. those other people out there too? Yes. But the majority <laughs> are to help you be successful. Yes. I know those people. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, as a business owner, and you know, so low, so long, I was so low, so many people that I was just like, oh my God. And you and I, we talked about this before, are really trusting people. And so we expect people to be men and women of their word and have integrity, but that's just not always how it is. So we're not saying this is going to be easy peasy. You're never going to run into any snakes. Sure, absolutely, you will, but you're going to put filters in place. You're not going to do this on your own. You're going to take your time. You're going to educate educate yourself. This is just to let you know what some ideas are out there, because I think this is important that you know that there are things out there besides your job, you know, especially when you grew up all your life saying, I just want to be a doctor, right? Or I just want to be a CPA, or I just want to be an engineer. You can do those things and you can do these other, these multiple, you can have these multiple streams of income too. Yes. Now, before we go, I have two more questions to ask you. One of them, what I noticed working in the legacy ward in the psychiatric hospital, people would get to these last days and there'd be all this question about, do they have anything to show for what they've done, right? People like you and I who are heroes and enthusiasts, we like helping people. We get excited about helping people. And sometimes we give everything away. We have nothing to, to give by the time we do pass away or leave this earth. So you wrote a book and it's how to create wealth that outlives you. Can you talk to us of some, about some ways to, to create wealth that outlive us? There's so many ways, so many things I want to say about that. Okay. So when I first started thinking about this, it was how much money could I leave to my children? That was mm-hmm. the, first, the first way I think about that. Mm-hmm. A- after I got past that, it is what's really important for me to leave to my children. So yes, I want them to be financially comfortable, but there's a two families, the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, they both, both of those families made tons of money, lots of money. The Vanderbilt family has pretty much lost all of their money. And the Rockefeller family has maintained their level of prosperity. And the difference was in reading the books is that the Rockefellers actually taught their children about making money and didn't just hand them money. Mm-hmm. And the same thing, and which the Vanderbilts made the money and then passed it to the children. 
and the children over two generations squandered it. Mm. So there, there's a bit more to that, but the biggest thing to me is, is involving your children in your money, making ideas, your money, making thoughts, your money, making struggles so that they can see that. And for me, that's the best, biggest legacy for my kids. They, they both understand neither one of my daughters, 29 and 26 have a job. They both are independent. Neither one of them is in my pocket anymore, but they don't have jobs. They have ways to make money and lots of different things. There's different kinds of insurance. There's so much we could talk about on this, but it's possible. So yes, I want them to have money and be comfortable and but I want them to remember me for the things I taught them. So that's the legacy part for me. Okay, got it. And so you said there's so many things that we can talk about, but we do have limited time and I want us to talk, but I want to pull out one or two that are, that you feel like are impactful and whatever, you know, whatever hits you right now, yeah. you, you can usually, you know, you can feel what the audience needs to hear. You have a podcast, so you can probably hear the audience saying, well, tell me one, like at least one or two, you know, I can hear them. I'm sure you can as a, as a, as a fellow podcast host. Yes. So what would you say are, you know, one or two ideas when it comes to, to leaving wealth or, or creating wealth that outlives you? This is a cha- little bit challenging concept. So there's a process called infinity banking. And this is mm. actually using a life insurance product. Don't close your ears, everybody. Don't, don't close your ears. It's not, <laughs> it's not what you think. It is a very interesting way to have life insurance. And it's written up in a particular way that leaves a lot and can pay you while you're still alive. Mm-hmm. And you can use that money to invest. Yes. And so we've talked about this on the podcast before, something similar. Well, I, I would say a guest talked about this on a podcast before. And I told the audience that when the crash in 2008 happened, uh, it didn't hit me right away, but right around 2010, I did have to use this strategy because I had had the insurance policy set up because somebody had told me about it when I first became a financial advisor and started that. And then in 2010, I started having to use that in order to kind of stay afloat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So okay. this is something that absolutely works. And no, we can't get into all the details and how it works. But do you talk about some of these things in your book? I actually don't talk about that in my book. Oh, it is okay. one of the things that I think I learned about it actually after my book, honestly. And I have a great friend who was actually on my podcast. So um, her hers hasn't been released yet, but that teaches it and actually can help you understand it. She's an educator, just like you, Kanae, like me, wants people to understand something before they actually go and put their money into it. So she's really good. I, we can talk about that later. Maybe you can get her on. Oh, yeah. And she has, she has a webinar that she does on a regular basis. So there's education out there about all of these things. I'm a real estate investor. I love real estate. I love investing in real estate. I love finding real estate deals. I love real estate that makes an impact in a community. So that's the legacy that I want to leave is not just for my children, but for the world and that I have made a difference everywhere I've been. Yeah. And that is what we can end on is this last thing that you just said, you want to do something that makes an impact. So the legacy that you're leaving is not just the money, but an impact. So whether that is a real estate investment to create healthy living environments for the elderly, or that is you know, what I create, like I'm teaching people to create their mission, whether it is the work that they do in in life, like what I do as a hypnotherapist, or if it's what you do outside, remember, know your cause. So Mm -hmm. it could be the thing you do with your life's work, but it could also be something you do outside of your work. And by talking to you, we kind of see you are a doctor who took the money you made in your practice to go out and invest in real estate. And then you took that first your first foundation in real estate higher to then open up assisted living facilities that you could put your name behind which you know could, that you could be proud of and then whether you're here or not those can still go on 
Correct. I also can I, help other people invest in things like assisted living. The oh, other yeah. impact product I have is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we're bringing food to food deserts, grocery stores to food deserts, 260,000 square foot indoor controlled farm where gross, where produce, organic produce is going to be grown in the Midwest year round and sold to those grocery stores I'm talking about, plus regionally to big retail places like Target and Walmart. Mm -hmm. So there are are lots of different ways to invest, to have an impact. So it's for me, my, my two big things are food and health and they very much go together. So when I, when I think about what I'm going to leave my money to and give my money to, it's going to be in those two categories. And now that I can put my real estate investing hat into those also, it makes me even happier. Yeah, that's a great way to, to look at it. It's like really find your cause again. Like we talked about, you find your cause for you. That is, that's the health and the food. Mm -hmm. And then like, for me, it's the wealth, the health, and the love. I'm all about the relationships. And so when you look at those are the things that you want to invest in, then you can find multiple income streams in those different areas, whether it be active or passive or semi-passive or investment, but you have options. And this episode today was really just to get us to open our minds to possibilities. See what one entrepreneur and healthcare professional is doing. See what is possible for you. And before we wrap up, and this should be juicy, I need to know what is the best advice you've ever received or the advice you wish somebody would have told you. Oh, can I, before I say that, I want to make sure everybody knows they can get a copy of my book. Sorry. Can I say that? Mm -hmm. Um, How to create wealth that outlives you. You can go to my website, moneywithmission.com, or we'll have it available through Kanae's website too. Either one. Okay. The thing that I wish someone had told me was that the thing you think is your thing in life. In other words, medicine for me, may not be your thing. Be open to change. Mm. Wow. So what I hear you saying is, you know how you grew up thinking that, oh, this is a thing I've got to do. And you just have it stuck in your head. And then you grow up and maybe you like it, maybe you don't. But because you said it was your thing, you feel like you're stuck in it and you got to stay there. And you're saying you you might have already done it. Like you grew up saying that's what you wanted to do, but maybe you did it. And now it's time for you to move on to something else. Is that kind of, do I hear you? A hundred percent. And it's okay. So many, some I my colleagues, we go into medicine and I think the general population thinks you're a doctor. So what else are you going to do? I heard, I've heard that so many things. What else can you do? You're a doctor. And it took me a long time to get into my head. I'm a doctor. I can do anything. Mm. I don't yeah. have to stay stuck here if that's not what I want. So that's, and, I, and anybody I talk to now who wants to go into medicine, the first thing I say to them is, that's great. You should do that. Don't think it's the last thing you're ever going to do. That's so good. It's so good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So guys, thank you for listening all the way to the end, getting all these golden nuggets. And I hope that your brain is now moving towards a new familiar to create multiple streams of income, not just getting stuck in that one income stream and doing all the work. You do not have to work your fingers to the bone. As me and Dr. Felicia have just told you, there are ways to create multiple streams of income that outlive you. So join me next week, same time, same place, a new subject. I'll see you sooner. Gandhi said, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your values. Your values become your destiny. So in essence, your beliefs eventually become your destiny. So in order to take control of your destiny, you have to first take control of your beliefs. But here's the thing. Most of us are controlled by our societal programming. Now you may be asking yourself, or me, what's societal programming? Societal programming is all the messages you've heard over and over and over again. Like money doesn't grow on trees or like it's better to give than to receive. Those statements repeated, 
eventually became your beliefs. But you can overcome it. And that's why I created my Path to Prosperity Workshop. Register today. It is the best two hours you will invest in your business and your life. I'll show you what societal programming is, help you gain clarity on your specific programming, and I'll give you a sample hypnotherapy session at the end so you can start breaking through your societal program immediately. Take control of your destiny. Register now. The link is in the show notes so you can get on the path to prosperity. I'll see you there. Thanks for listening all the way to the end, my Prosperity Pro. I want to stay connected with you. Here are four ways. Pick the one that works best for you if you want to stay connected with me. One, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Send them to podcast at presidentiallifestyle.com. I'd love it if you would make a one or two minute audio message and attach it to an email. That'd be the easiest way for me to get it. Ask me anything about creating a life of meaning over money, and I'll get you an answer. Remember, the email address is podcast at presidentiallifestyle.com. Two, subscribe to this podcast and share it with your friends because you guys might want to have a discussion about it, especially if they're a CEO who wants to shift from the old American dream to a life of meaning. Three, we try not to have any sponsors on this show unless they are truly in line with our values. I mean, really a good fit. So that means we fund this podcast ourselves. I'd like you to take a look at our resource page to see if there's any products or services that we recommend that are right for you. If not, no worries, maybe later. If so, please use our affiliate link to purchase. Thank you in advance for doing that. You are such an amazing person. Okay, four and last. If you want to know what's happening over here at Presidential Lifestyle and you want us to email you the update, then go to presidentiallifestyle.com slash blog slash now. And you'll see the current updated blog for the week. But you'll also see a link to subscribe to that blog. We can email it to you if you like. That's presidentiallifestyle.com slash blog slash now. Don't worry. You don't have to remember that link or any links. They're all in the show notes. Oh, and I forgot to say, if you're enjoying this podcast, go ahead and leave us a review and tell us how much you're enjoying it. And now for the legal ease. This podcast is not to replace professional counsel. The best advice is from a professional who knows you and your specific situation. The topics discussed in this podcast are general in nature and for informational or entertainment purposes only. We encourage you to meet with a professional that you can discuss your specific situation with. Whether you choose us or someone else, one-on-one counsel is important whether it's a financial, therapeutic, legal, or other decision. So that's all for now. I'll see you next episode. And remember, you can have wealth in all of its forms. Believe it, and you'll soon see it.